Greetings and a warm welcome to our curator's introduction. We're delighted to share with you a special exhibition of a group of recently rediscovered drawings by the Japanese master Katsushika Hokusai, acquired by the British Museum last year, 2020, and now on display for the first time ever. Within this small unassuming box was contained a stack of 103 original brush drawings, carefully mounted on card. As you can see in the photograph at right, being examined by one of our British Museum colleagues, these drawings are about postcard size, measuring 11 by 15 centimeters. The drawings were brushed in ink on thin paper and were later individually mounted on pieces of card. Here you see the drawings laid out on the table of the students' room when they first arrived into the museum, and you get a sense of just how many there are exploded from this one tiny little box. And thousands of prints Sheet prints were designed by the artist Hokusai and survive today, but this group of drawings is an exceptionally rare survival. They were brushed directly by his hand. From the inscription on that storage box, we know that they were intended for an illustrated encyclopedia called The Great Picture Book of Everything, in Japanese, Banmotsu Ehon Daizen. The drawings would have been destroyed in order to make the printing blocks for that book. But for some reason, the book was never published, and so these unique drawings survive. Although the drawings were numbered by a later collector, one of our puzzles has been to study the images and inscriptions and attempt to recreate what might have been the original order. Many questions remain about this fascinating group, and our research continues. The content of the 103 drawings falls into three broad areas, ancient China, as well as peoples of the lands beyond, Buddhist India, and the natural world. Although Japan in Hokusai's day was a closed society where people were not permitted to travel abroad, his work reflects a keen interest in foreign lands, the classical heritage of East Asia, and nature. Hokusai was a master of the brush, bringing a vivid imagination to everything he painted and drew. And in this project, he deployed his boundless imagination, skill, and creativity to conjure up things both seen and unseen. So Katsushika Hokusai is one of Japan's most prolific and inventive artists. He is perhaps best known as the designer of the print popularly called The Great Wave from the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. But he in fact produced thousands of prints and paintings. and there is one of his paintings, along with illustrations for nearly 270 illustrated books. And these are just a few examples of his work. Hokusai, which is his given name, lived from 1760 to 1849. That is by Japanese count, 90 years, perhaps double the expected lifespan for his day. And throughout this time, his brush never stopped moving. He was always sketching, drawing, painting, and he was vastly famous. He married twice and had a son and three daughters. One daughter named Oi, who lived from about 1800 to after 1857, took after her father and became a successful artist in her own right. She married briefly, but when the marriage failed, returned to live with Hokusai, perhaps around the late 1820s, and remained with Hokusai until the end of his life. Hokusai lived during the latter part of what is called the Edo period, which ran from 1615 to 1868, broadly speaking, a time of peace and prosperity in which Japan was ruled by a samurai military government centering on the Tokugawa family. It was also a time in which the Tokugawa government banned foreign travel. Even so, there was still considerable commercial and cultural exchange with Dutch and Chinese traders through the southern port of Nagasaki. Imported books, such as picture encyclopedias, introduced Japanese people to the faraway places they could not visit. 
Here is an expanded edition of a popular Japanese encyclopedia from 1789, based on an earlier book compiled in 1666. The later edition features new subjects, such as the Chinese deities that gave human beings agriculture and music on the left. Picture encyclopedias covered diverse topics, from geography, the body, clothing, and precious stones, to animals, dragons, and plants. Following these earlier models, Hokusai's drawings for the great picture book explore subjects related to ancient China and surrounding lands, Buddhist India, and the natural world. Two letters from Hokusai to his publisher, Suzanbo, indicate that Hokusai was still working on the great picture book into his final years, the 1840s, when he was living in Edo, which is present day Tokyo, with Oi. Sometime after he stopped working on the great picture book, this wooden box was made to house his drawings. The inscription on the cover reads, as Rosina just mentioned, illustrations for the great picture book of everything, Banmotsu Eihon Daizenzu, and the artist's name, drawn by old man Iitsu Katsushika, the former Hokusai. Here, Hokusai introduces two of the main subjects of his drawings, India and China. At right stands an Indian Buddhist priest holding a ceremonial fly whisk. At left stands a Chinese boy holding a Chinese style fan. The archaic Chinese characters in the oval cartouche between them read in two columns from right to left, India, China. And a small red seal in the bottom left corner establishes that the drawings were once owned by Henri Weber, a leading French Art Nouveau jeweler and one of Europe's most important collectors of Japanese art in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Paris. When the drawings came up at auction in Paris in 2019, the London-based dealer in Japanese art, Israel Goldman, recognized their importance and felt they belonged in a public collection where they could be shared with the world and no better place than the British Museum. Tim Clark, who was head of the Japanese section at the time, agreed. Subsequent wide consultation with scholars and Hokusai specialists in Japan, Europe, and the USA confirmed that the drawings are by Hokusai. The acquisition was made possible by the Theresia Goethe Buch request, established in memory of her parents, Rudolf and Julie Buch, with support from Art Fund with a contribution from the Wilson Foundation. Commercial trade connected China and Japan during the Edo period, but China was also a source of ancient lore and tradition. Legendary Chinese warriors provided standards of bravery and discipline, while classical Chinese poets and, that, and spiritual masters inspired Japanese scholars and religious practitioners. In his drawings for the great picture book, Hokusai conceives these narratives afresh with characteristic verve and individuality. Some subjects, though, are unusual for picture encyclopedias. Perhaps Hokusai or his publisher had hoped to redefine what the genre could be. Shu Wang Mu, in Japanese Seobo, or the Queen Mother of the West, is the goddess of prosperity and longevity. Widely worshipped widely in East Asia, she is often depicted in her peach garden on Mount Kunlun, which, according to legend, bears fruit once in several thousand years. Hokusai, as you can see here, presents her instead as a royal personage, reclining in a carriage accompanied by female attendants, three of high rank wearing elaborate headdresses, and five lower ranking. One shy attendant appears half hidden behind the carriage at top right. The faces and robes are beautifully and minimally modeled, and typically of Hokusai style, the eyes do not have lines under the lids. And here you can see a detail of uh, Shu Wang Mu's face and the um, way Hokusai depicts the eyes. Chinese origin myths explain the beginnings of nearly every aspect of human civilization. Musical performance began with the creation of the transverse hearth. Hokusai's drawings also explore the origins of medicine, carpentry, weights and measures, and wine brewing. 
Fittingly for a planned publication, one drawing explains the origins of printing, papermaking, and ink. The inventions are associated with mythical emperors who ruled in the distant past. And here, the god of agriculture, Shen Nong, and two boys prepare herbal medicine. A similar uh, Hokusai's China illustrations also lead the viewer on inspiring adventures. They include Taoist masters who could fly, a cunning general, and a warrior subduing a giant snake. We also find torches that never extinguish, a severed head leaping out of a boiling cauldron to exact revenge on its enemies, and the monkey hero of the Ming Dynasty novel, Journey to the West. These subjects fall outside the range of standard picture encyclopedias, but are within Hokusai's repertoire. Here, Liu Bang, founder of the Han Dynasty, beheads a giant white snake. A similar illustration was published in volume three of Hokusai's illustrated narratives of the War of Han and Chu, suggesting that although the great picture book was not produced, aspects of the project may have generated other publications. Though prevented from traveling, Japanese people of the Edo period continued to be interested in other lands and cultures. Eight drawings in the group show figures from East, Southeast, and Central Asia, along with people from fanciful lands. These figures are standard for encyclopedias of the time. Hokusai, however, brings them to life almost as individuals. Here, he shows men from, from right to left, India, China, and Korea. And now Rosina will explore the drawings related to India and the process of woodblock printing for which the drawings were originally intended. Thank you, Alfred. Yeah. I'm going to start with the woodblock printing process. In the exhibition, we display some of the tools and equipment that were needed for the technique of woodblock printing. This is an ancient technology that was used for hundreds of years in Japanese temples for printing Buddhist books, but developed commercially in Japan in the 17th century onwards as the publishing industry expanded rapidly. Here you see two stages of Hokusai's most famous print design, the Great Wave. The artist's drawing is pasted face down onto a polished block of wood, usually mountain cherry wood at top left there. And using chisels that you can see on the right, the block cutter cuts through that paper drawing to create a relief pattern in the block. And that block is then inked and a sheet of paper laid over it. And it's rubbed with a disc of coiled bamboo rope covered in bamboo leaf called a baren. And you can see that at bottom right. And here you see the process underway, again with stages of the Great Wave being printed. On the left, the block is being cut, cutting through that drawing, in the left two photos, and then on the right, the sheet is being printed, rubbed from the back, and then pulled off the block. And the Great Wave had multiple color tones, but this great picture book of everything was a monochrome book that would have been more affordable. So moving on to the second category, the second subsection within the group of drawings, it's images related to the land of India and the people of India and the religion of India. For Hokusai and his contemporaries, the Indian subcontinent was the land of the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni. And the first few drawings in this group relate to the Buddhist faith. Others portray episodes from the 400s to 300s BC when Buddhism was founded. Hokusai presents the narratives with an almost palpable sense of excitement, as though he was discovering them for the first time. This is the Buddhist figure uh, Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, or Guan Yin in Chinese, and Kannon in Japanese. All of these deities have many names across the different cultures and languages. And this is one of the 33 manifestations of this particular deity, as described in one of the Buddhist sutras. The figure Kannon is a bodhisattva, a merciful being who has achieved enlightenment, but who chooses to stay in the world to help others on that journey towards enlightenment. And Hokusai has used formal, quite sharp lines to depict the deity, and then more informal brushworks brush marks, excuse me, for the dragon and these very atmospheric inky clouds.
And a similar composition appears in another book by Hokusai called Hokusai's Album Drawn True to Life of 1814, which is displayed next to the drawing in the exhibition. In the drawing, you can see by comparison with the book that Hokusai has deepened the conception, endowing both the god and the dragon with a greater feeling of humanity, approachability, perhaps you could say. In the drawing on the left here, we have three of the dragon kings who are amongst the protectors, classes, various classes of protectors of Buddhism. Some of them wear dragon head crowns or carry wish granting jewels. One of these Buddhist sutras called the Lotus Sutra, a central text in the religion, describes how these guardian figures assembled with other deities and the Buddha's disciples to hear the teachings of the Buddha. And these dragon kings originated from serpent deities in India. The same figures appeared in a popular printed encyclopedia, the Illustrated Compendium of Buddhist Images, first issued in 1690. And it shows the continuity of this type of information being provided. But Hokusai has reinvented the figures here, changing rather static models into dynamic, energetic beings that interact with each other. And on the right, we have a drawing of Arhats. These are human disciples of the Buddha who have advanced along the path of enlightenment, but not yet attained full Buddhahood. They're typically portrayed as Indian holy men in monastic robes. But Hokusai presents them as genial and approachable old men gathered together in conversation. In one of the most spectacular drawings in the whole group, the whole collection, we see the king Vidudaka, who was uh, the king of the Koshala region in India during the lifetime of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni. And Vidudaka plotted to annihilate the Buddha's family, the Shaka clan, but as foretold by the Buddha, he was punished. He was a bolt of lightning struck him dead during his victory banquet. And here Virudaka's robes whirl around him as he's thrown backwards off his feet. The rays from the lightning blast seem to burst in three dimensions out through his sides, behind him, towards us, weaving in with his feet and clothing. And the exploding rays of Hokusai's lightning bolt seem to prefigure modern manga by about a century. And this drawing is one of six in the group that relate to an album held in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale. And you can see the preparatory drawing, the earliest stage working drawing at the bottom of this page in the album. And when we compare it with Hokusai's finished drawing, we see that sophistication of conception, the journey that his art took from that very early stage through to the finished drawing that was ready to be cut onto the block. And lastly, for India, in our little selection here, we have a character known as Fume Choja in Japanese, uh, the Japanese reading of the Indian king, Srutasoma. And here he holds a scroll, presumably to conjure up this strange being to his left, the nine-tailed fox spirit that emerges from the clouds. The tales of India and Buddhism often had mischievous fox spirits who took the form of beautiful women. They took on disguises and tricked people. And these stories remained popular well into Hokusai's day. But I particularly wanted to point out Hokusai's use of softly gradated ink tones here. that's particularly skillful to conjure up this vision of a strange nine-tailed being. And I'll hand back to Alfred now to tell us a little bit about Hokusai's books. Thank you. For 50 years, publishers commissioned Hokusai to illustrate scenes of daily life, warrior tales, anthologies, anthologies of Chinese poetry, and art manuals, such as the famous Hokusai sketches or Hokusai manga. Hokusai designed illustrations for almost 270, 270 books, many with multiple volumes, each volume containing 10 to 20 illustrations. His output in this field was vast. Hokusai's books were sold in urban bookstores, in, in urban bookshops, 
and reached the provinces through traveling libraries. Aspiring painters across the country studied his art manuals. His warrior tales appealed to anyone interested in adventure, including adults, and his poetry books addressed an educated audience. Picture encyclopedias, such as the Great Picture Book, were used to teach children. In this Sorry. In this two-volume poetry anthology, Hokusai depicts locations in his home city of Edo. Beside the Sumida River, which runs through the center of Edo, beautiful women from a restaurant bid farewell to two guests as their sleeves billow in the wind. The printed colors in this copy are beautifully preserved. During the late 1790s to early 1800s, Hokusai found a niche illustrating richly produced anthologies and prints for amateur poetry clubs. Most books during this period were monochrome, black and white. Color printed books were expensive to produce and are relatively rare, apart from specialty art books for which there was still a substantial market. Books of information, such as the Great Picture Book, would have been published in black and white. From the 1810s, Hokusai achieved lasting fame with his series of drawing manuals entitled Hokusai's Sketches or Hokusai Manga. Hokusai personally described the drawings as manga, meaning random sketches. A few subjects from the series recur in the drawings for the great picture book. For example, in the top right corner of these pages, you see the, the Chinese general Wu Zexu, who supports a bronze vessel while writing out a scholarly text thus combining the strengths of the warrior and statesman as perhaps the first Renaissance man. This Chinese hero is also in the China section of Hokusai's drawings. And here is a wonderful quotation from the preface to this volume, which is the first volume of Hokusai's sketches. Hokusai has produced 300 plus drawings of everything from Taoist immortals, Buddhist gods, scholar officials and women to birds, beasts, plants, and trees. Nothing is lacking. He conjures deities with a wave of his brush. And this might easily be said of the 103 drawings for the great picture book of everything. The bold style that Hokusai developed for Chinese and warrior subjects served him well in the early 1830s. During this time, the publisher Kobayashi Shinbei, Suzambo, commissioned him to illustrate Tang Poetry Illustrated an anthology of Tang Dynasty Chinese poems with Japanese translations. In a surviving letter, Hokusai instructs the block cutters working on the book exactly how to reproduce the eyes and noses in his drawings. He was extremely concerned that a publication should reflect his work, and it is possible that the challenge of living up to his standards may have hindered production of the great picture book, to which I'll now return. Hokusai's animals and birds often engage the viewer with a distinctive penetrating gaze. Some of his designs for the great picture book recall illustrations in a collection of pictures to enlighten the young or a later edition, suggesting that he may have used this picture encyclopedia as a reference. The British Museum's drawings cover mainly land animals and birds with only four illustrations of useful plants and minerals. Another group of drawings in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, however, depicts numbers of plants, fish, and other natural subjects that seem to complement the British Museum's drawings, suggesting that the two groups must have formed part of the same project, although the full scope of the project is as yet unknown. Sorry. In this expertly detailed drawing, Hokusai pairs a soaring bird of paradise at the top with the mythical Chinese Zhanzhan, a conjoined husband and wife bird with shared wings. The deft brush marks suggest the airiness of the bird's feathers, as well as their otherworldly freedom and grace. This bold dynamic work seems an apt expression of Hokusai's own unfettered imagination. 
skillfully compressed into a small frame, the composition would retain its integrity on almost any scale. So here on the left, an overgrown hibiscus serves as the backdrop to a wonderfully observed standoff between two street cats. In Hokusai's sketches, volume 14, published in the mid 1850s after Hokusai's death, a black and white pet cat, similar to the one on the left, carries a dead rat in its jaws. Hokusai also featured the hibiscus in a print series of the 1830s. In this way, we often find him returning to and rethinking subjects. On the right, in a drawing, assorted aquatic birds paddle around in pondweed. Hokusai has designed a balanced, nearly symmetrical composition that still brims with movement and energy. Clockwise from the top right, for those of you who may be interested in birds, are a little grebe, a mallard duck, a swan, a mandarin duck, and a gull. Similar mallards feature in other works by Hokusai, including a late hanging, hanging scroll painting from 1847 in the collection of the British Museum, which is widely recognized as one of Hokusai's late masterpieces. And in his illustrated book on the far right, which is a detailed art manual in which he shares all that he knew about preparing and applying pigments. In past centuries, Japan's coasts and mountains were filled with native wildlife, including larger animals such as sea otters, bear, deer, and wild boar. Water buffalo were domesticated in southern Japan, but Hokusai depicts one with high-spirited independence. Tigers and leopards, however, did not exist in Japan, and to depict them, Japanese artists like, like Hokusai referred to earlier illustrations. And here, for example, are the images of a tiger and leopard in one of the first encyclopedias produced in Japan during the Edo period, a collection of pictures to enlighten the young of 1666, which I have already mentioned. And here is Hokusai's reimagining of the two animals in a shared environment and how they interact. He informs us that tigers are scared of brown bears while leopards are scared of tigers. Hokusai gives us a sense of these two ferocious creatures as real and alive. And now earlier I mentioned the process of international consultation and collaboration that led to the museum's acquisition of the drawings and research into them. And Rosina will now explain more about that. Thank you, Alfred. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a, a box of puzzles to a large extent. The 103 drawings came with no explanation other than the title and a group of scholars across the world coordinated by our former curator here at in the Japanese collections at the British Museum, who is now an honorary research fellow, Tim Clark. This team has been trying to understand the drawings assigned that attribution to Hokusai definitively by comparison with other works, tease out all of the meanings of the, the imagery and the texts. And all of that information has been brought together in our collections online, which is available via the museum's website and in a publication by Timothy Clark. Those international collaborators have primarily been the four people you see on the right of the screen here. Professor Asano Shugo, who is a specialist in Japanese paintings and prints of the 17th to 19th centuries and is director of the Yamato Bunkakan and the Abeno Harukas Art Museum in Japan. And then the late great Roger Keyes, who sadly passed away last year and the publication for this exhibition has been in memory of him, has been created in memory of him and he's now our guiding spirit and his pupil uh, Professor Yasuhara, Professor Emeritus at Brown University, and then Sarah Thompson, who is Curator of Japanese Prints at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. So all of the information that we're sharing with you today and that you will find in the, in the exhibition and in the publication is very much a group effort and we're grateful to them for their contribution. And now Alfred is going to tell us a little bit about the the complexity of Hokusai's prints and tracking down another detective story, tracking down information about his most famous one. 
So part of um, the activities of the British Museum is not only acquisition and study of uh, scholarly research in terms of the ancient past, it is also um, a scientific research. And somewhere between 5,000 and 15,000 copies of Hokusai's famous print under the wave off Kanagawa, known as the Great Wave, were printed during the Edo period. They were produced by hand, so no two are identical and relatively few have survived. Following a method pioneered by Roger Keyes, who Rosina has just mentioned, British Museum scientist Capucine Korenberg has been searching for surviving impressions of the Great Wave. She has located 111, of which the British Museum holds three from the Edo period. By identifying small differences visible to the trained eye, her research uncovers the history of the original woodblocks and the evolving interpretation of Hokusai's design. That's the end of our introduction to the exhibition today, and we invite you warmly to come and explore Hokusai's world through the great picture book of everything. And there's also the associated publication I mentioned by Timothy Clark, which reproduces all 103 drawings at original size, so you can hold them in your hand and explore them closely. Thank you very much for listening today, and we're now going to take a few questions. So we've had a lot of questions by the looks of it, and I'm just having a look through them here, and perhaps Alfred and I can share yes. which ones we uh, are going to take up. Let's see. Alfred, perhaps you'd like to talk about uh, some of our ideas about what motivated Hokusai in his choice of subjects in this book, or the selection of subjects. Mm. And uh, this book isn't all of, this isn't the, the entire picture book of everything. So right. perhaps that topic you can take up. Yes, it, it is an ambitious title, um, the great picture book of everything. Um, we have, as I mentioned, just three large subjects, and the way Hokusai has handled two of them is unusual. So that although the project as a whole seems to be based on earlier uh, models of, of encyclopedias, there is also a large sense in which he is sort of pushing the boundaries and expanding. And whether that is sort of, um, Hokusai himself or his publisher who may have had ambitions because Hokusai in no way is producing all of this on speculation. All of this is being commissioned by his publisher. And in the two letters that I mentioned at the beginning in which Hokusai mentions that we have um, that directly connect Hokusai with this project are Hokusai's receipts for payment for uh, small groups of drawings, three or four, but one letter is written, the, the letters are, are one day apart and they're dated, they're, they're datable by Hokusai's address because we, Hokusai, we know, changed uh, residences dozens, if, if not as many as 90 times as, as is reported, but dozens of times. And the, the, the address that is um, indicated on the letters for him dates the letters to about the mid 1840s. So he was working on this project for a very long time and uh, the ambitions seem to have been quite great. And those may also have been an impediment to the, to the production of, of, that the scope of the project was perhaps more than um, Hokusai could handle and may have been uh, left uncompleted at his death. Thank you. There's another question here about how he did his research, how he came up with the, the material for the book that perhaps you could speak a little bit about the, the previous encyclopedias. You showed one example at the beginning, mm. but how Hokusai is drawing on earlier content. Mm. Yes. Um, we saw from, from, from a, just a few examples that Hokusai is referring to earlier examples, many, many uh, subjects in, particularly in the India section and the sort of historical, the early historical, the sort of the mythological subjects in, in the great and the picture book of everything do seem to have precedence in earlier encyclopedias. It is the adventure stories that seem to have been a new element here. 
and um, so this is a kind of blended encyclopedia in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, earlier encyclopedias were, as I mentioned, um, teaching tools. They were often simply vocabularies so that you would have a picture and a word to say, this is a leopard, this is a tiger. In a way, this encyclopedia seems more culturally informative because it draws in stories that are outside the range of usual encyclopedias. And many of them have, and we know the subjects in these, in these drawings because there's, there are inscriptions on, the, on them. So the, the drawings tell us what the subjects are, but sometimes they're unusual and you have to dig a little deeper, but we do have a hint. Thank you. There's been a couple of questions about Hokusai's daughter, so perhaps I can speak a little bit about her. And Alfred mentioned her at the beginning of the our introduction. The question is, did she contribute to Hokusai's paintings? Was she ever published? Now, she was published. She produced her own sort of, um, not encyclopedia, but a manual of information for women, so a useful uh, reference book. Um, called Ehon on Natural Hawkey, the, the treasury, uh, the picture book treasury for women. So she was certainly published. She was an active artist. And after her marriage fell apart, she moved back in with her father. And she produced finished signed paintings. There's a, a relatively small number of signed paintings by her, but some very, very accomplished works. So yes, there's definitely a uh, an assumption that she was helping with some of her father's works, especially in his later years, because he lived to this tremendous age of 90. And of course, there's a possibility that in a large project like the Great Picture Book of Everything, she was contributing. She had been trained by her father, so her style was very similar to his, or she could certainly emulate his style very closely, uh, even if she took her own direction sometimes in her own works. So it's very difficult to tell. I think like any large or any successful artist studio, there's a lot of um, support and contribution from the pupils. And just to add to that, that this is possibly a topic for future research as more becomes known about Oi, how, how her work fits in with Hokusai's late work will be sort of an ongoing topic. That name Hokusai itself though was such a, a draw, such a brand name, and he himself knew that. He had to keep using that name Hokusai, so I think her contributions got subsumed within that brand a lot of the time. And um, I think that's that's what we can say about Oi. Um, another question that came in, uh, several questions about the technical side of things, the woodblock printing process. Did Hokusai carve his own blocks? I thought it was interesting because there's a yes and no side to that, isn't there? Yes, there's sort of an early and late side, isn't there? Yes, Hokusai, it, by report, Hokusai, um, Hokusai was the son of a mirror polisher um, in Katsushika, which is in, uh, an area in the eastern, uh, I mentioned the Sumida River, which runs through the center of Edo. Katsushika is sort of the area to the east, which is um, more rural and a more commoner area. His father is said to have been a mirror polisher by appointment to a uh, samurai family. Um, but Hokusai in his early years may have apprenticed in the shop of a woodblock cutter. So he may have had direct experience with cutting blocks. So the answer in that sense is yes. But, but in this period that we're talking about for the great picture book, by that point, he was working with publishers and publishers would have then commissioned the block cutters and the printers and the, handled the distribution. So all of that is then under the auspices of the publisher. But Hokusai is specifically involved in selecting the block cutters that he wants to translate his drawings into uh, a woodblock. So he, he's very involved in the process. Thank you. There's a question here that uh, sounds very straightforward, but we don't have a full answer necessarily, is what happened to the book? What happened to the drawings for the book? after they were made. Ah, right, well, would you, sure. would you like to speculate? We, we believe that the drawings were made between, uh, or during the period between 1829, because there's a date um, that's mentioned on a text page with the drawings, 1829 through to the 1840s, when Alfred mentioned that we have 
receipts from Hokusai uh, acknowledging that he's received payment for some of these drawings that he's handed them over to the publisher. So it could be a 15 year period and Alfred uh, gave a few ideas about why that book wasn't published, but there were other books by Hokusai that had um, a difficult trajectory towards publication or certain volumes never made it to print. So at some point these drawings were um, acknowledged as being of artistic value. They were mounted individually on card as I described and this beautiful storage box was made for them in the mid to late 18th, uh, 19th century, excuse me, we don't exactly know when, and a, a lovely silk wrapper um, that they sit inside within the box. And then in the late 19th century, they were exported from Japan, we assume as part of the huge popularity of Japanese art during that period, known today as Japonisme, by the French term Japonisme, and they were purchased by Henri Vevere, whose seal we saw on that title on the frontispiece page. And they stayed in the Vevere collection until his death, and they were sold at auction a few years after his death. They were in a private collection for about 70 years, and then they re-emerged at auction. And we were able to purchase them to share with everybody. I think there's a, an interesting question here about the intended readership for mm. a book like this. So perhaps yes. you can talk about both previous encyclopedias, who they were intended for, and then who might have bought this book by Hawkeye that has been published. Right. Well, that I think is an interesting, that is another sort of question of sort of like, we don't know, but we try to, an, an informed guess, that's as much as we can guess, because um, for books, all books in this period, all, almost all published books, have a preface explaining what they were for, who the audience, who the author was, and if they are if they are illustrated books, the author of the preface may be uh, an author, and then commenting on the artist and how wonderful the artist is, and so on, and who the intended audience may have been, and particularly for illustrated uh, painting manuals, in Hokusai's case, very often they are geared towards um, children. So there's usually a preface to give a to give us a guide as to how an, a, a book was aimed. In this case, because the book is incomplete, the preface is usually one of the last things that's that's composed. In this case, we don't have a preface. So it is very difficult to specify who the audience would have been. Um, encyclopedias in this period, as encyclopedias everywhere are in young readership to inform people about the world. Um, the, the, the blended character of, of this uh, book is both informative about ancient history and stories and, and, and mythology and animals, which is plainly informative, but it is also inviting us on, as I mentioned, adventures and, and uh, stories that are more in character with Hokusai's other books. So is this a Hokusai encyclopedia rather than an encyclopedia and how that all works to, how, how would you market such a book is, I think, a question that we'll, we'll sort of keep turning over. Mm. This is Hokusai's vision yes. of the world, of the universe, the, the things seen and unseen. There's a, another technical question here of how could the ink, uh, the ink work that um, beautiful soft ink tones have been reproduced in print. Would you like to try that? Yeah, I think that's one of the, the main questions. We have a book in the exhibition by one of Hokusai's pupils, uh, a landscape view that has beautiful, um, softly gradated, the this, this shading from dark to light, um, a beautiful manipulation of the ink. Um, and there's a technique uh, in woodblock printing where the printer inks the block, so he applies ink to the block, but then he can carefully wipe some of it away to get this, um, this soft, um, transition from dark to light. So it's possible, but any kind of special um, special techniques like that, uh, more technically sophisticated approaches, will take time and it will take money. And so there's uh, an idea, a suggestion, that that could have been one of the reasons that the book was difficult to print, not just this incredibly fine, delicate brushwork that you have to reproduce on the block as very thin, delicate lines, but also that, um, that subtle shading. And we know that Hokusai was very demanding about the standard of printing for his books. And he would write to the publisher and say, this isn't good enough, I want the box recut. I don't like the way you've done the eyes, I don't like the way you've done the noses. 
and the publisher agreed sometimes. So he obviously had uh, enough traction that he could influence how things were being done. So maybe he was a, a tricky, not tricky customer exactly, but a tricky artist who um, was pushing too far. He was trying to achieve so much with this book visually. So that's the technical question about ink. There's a, a very straightforward, but again, quite complicated question here about Hokusai's art. And what distinguishes it from other artists of his time? Now, Alfred was in the late Hokusai research project that culminated in our exhibition in 2017. So I think he spent a lot of time thinking about Hokusai's art, but yes, it's difficult to summarize. It is we'll difficult try. to summarize, yes. Um, I think one of the one of the great I mean in a way that's a question of how do you start to look at Hokusai and um, one of the sort of starting points of course I would recommend of course seeing our exhibition which is a great place to sort of see the artist's hand and his um, his uh, way of rendering the human figure and his um, interest in uh, characterizing people in a particular moment. And all of that, as well as in the drawings, um, may be just as accessible in the Hokusai manga, which is the Hokusai sketches, which is book after book after book, where, where just as in his own day, people just kept turning the pages and just astonished at the variety of uh, the variety and the invention and how how plausible these were. It's not necessarily that he was literally sketching what he saw but it was drawing he was he was transferring through the brush things that were in his head and they just entered his head and perfectly formed on paper so he, he was almost a magician with a brush so it we unfortunately cannot see him at work but we do have um the traces of his brush in various forms on painting and his astonishing technical facility in um every medium line and also beautiful color in many cases and so the um painting i didn't uh, dwell on for too long is the hanging scroll of the ducks that would be another sort of late example of of his his fantastic uh, facility in an interest in the world he was in some ways you know you could say artists are sort of two different categories of artists more, more artists some artists are more spiritual some artists are more material. And I, of that sort of large division, Hokusai is more a materialist, but he is fascinated with everything there is in the world. And for him, there is something, uh, a kind of energy running through everything. And that that is not exactly something that you can, that I can describe and say, oh, yes, this is Hokusai. But there's an approach to subjects that is seems characteristic and a way that his subjects engage with the viewer in a way that other artists don't. And I think that energy, that movement, that sense of movement is captured in so many of the drawings that they seem to crystallize a point of movement. And that's so expressive of Hokusai's energy, isn't it? And that, that drive, that strength, that energy that kept him going to such an advanced age and um, so unusually for his period. There's a question here about travel that I can take. Why was travel banned? And um, how that relates to the subject of the book. Japan had um, been visited by Portuguese traders in the 1500s through to the early 1600s, and also English traders, Dutch traders, and there was this um, commerce was being conducted during those decades, but there was a growing sense of anxiety in Japan that they could be subject to takeover by a foreign power. There was concern about the, um, the spread of Christianity. Uh, there were priests coming with these commercial traders who were proselytizing. And gradually through the early 1600s, this anxiety grew and it resulted in a total ban on Christianity. And uh, the Catholic traders were also banned from Japan uh, finally by 1639, but the Dutch traders were allowed to stay and trade in a very limited capacity from Nagasaki. Uh, but the Chinese traders still came in large numbers. So that was the extent of contact with foreigners. And there were also Korean embassies visiting periodically. But Japanese people were not allowed to leave Japan. 
And this was the method, the strategy by the Tokugawa government, this military government um, by a hereditary um, figure of the Tokugawa clan. This was their strategy to control what was going on in Japan um, and um, suppress any kind of dissent, any kind of challenge to their authority. Yes, and I, and I would add to that, though, I mean, it's, it's interesting, and, and I think a future program in, in associated with the exhibition will discuss this idea about what did this sort of pressure cooker of, of isolation and, and limitation, how did it affect people's understanding of the world and what they thought about the world? So that's something that will come up. But I think it's important also to consider that although tr travel was ab abroad was limited, that there was tremendous exchange within Japan. Mm. Books traveled everywhere. Manuscripts traveled everywhere. Mm. There were goods being manufactured in the north that were available in the south. And there was a lot of exchange and commerce. And, you know, Japan is an island nation. Uh, and there were trade ships plying the waters all around the entire Japanese archipelago. So it is a thriving society. And I think it's important to, while, 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 while we do have an idea of, of the stratification of, of Tokugawa society, the samurai at the top and, and the merchants at the bottom and so on, there was a lot of um, lateral movement as well and a lot of interchange. So that's part of, I think, maybe part of what Hokusai, what we sense, the sort of the underlying ferment of Edo society is part of what we may sense in Hokusai's work as well. Mm -hmm. The question also <clears throat> suggested that the book didn't get published because of this control, because it represents foreign lands. But I don't think that's an element because there was tremendous interest in the rest of the world. Books on Christianity were banned, but there was a relaxation of imports on books in 1720. So as long as it didn't concern Christianity, foreign books were allowed in and there was tremendous interest in European um, contemporary scientific knowledge, anatomy, etc., natural history. So these are not controversial subjects by any means in the great picture book of everything. These are very respectable, erudite subjects in many ways about ancient Chinese history and mythology and Buddhism in India. So there's no suggestion there that they were difficult topics. We, we think it's more of an uh, artistic differences or um, commercial reasons. But following on from that commercial side, there's a question, would Hokusai have made money from these drawings? What was the balance between mm. artist and publisher? Well, that's interesting. Did he get royalties? Mm. Um, not for this book when it wasn't not, published. Not for this, I don't think for any book. Mm. Hokusai, was, it was piecework. He produced a drawing, he was paid for it. And from that point, the publisher, it was up to the publisher to do with what the publisher thought best. And copyright in this period was possession of the woodblocks. And that, that remained with the publisher. So Hokusai was very successful for an artist. He commanded very high fees, relatively, for his drawings. But did the vast success of Hokusai's manga benefit him as such in terms of returns over time? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think so. But each successful publication increases his reputation. Yes, reputation, yes. And makes him attractive to publishers, but also to private clients who could be commissioning him for poetry. Maybe the poetry anthology is a little bit earlier, but commissioning him for paintings. Paintings, yes. That his reputation, his um, his name recognition just grows and grows and continues after his death and, and grows internationally after his death. Mm. There's a, a question about um, two slightly more technical questions about the paper that these were printed, uh, excuse me, that these were drawn on. Oh. And um, perhaps we could talk about the paper that they would have been printed on as well. So the, yeah, the, the paper for the drawings is incredibly thin because it would, it needed to be cut through. It needed to be translucent. You need to be able to see through it. And there are various techniques for getting that paper as thin as possible when it's pasted onto the printing block. Um, so oil is sometimes used to make it translucent and then you can even peel away fibers on the back of paper. Um, but we believe it's a type of paper uh, called minogami, mino paper, hundreds of types of um, handmade, um, acid free, very high quality Japanese paper available. And um, the, the printing industry, the publishing industry was very sophisticated, had different types, um, different materials being used for different purposes. 
Um, but the type of paper that you usually find in books um, and for single sheet prints like the Great Wave is usually causal. So it's the, the mulberry tree made from the bark of the mulberry tree. I think perhaps we've got time for a couple more questions. One of them was about shadows, that we don't see shadows ah, right. in Hokusai's work. And, and there's, a, there's an aspect there about a difference between paintings and prints, perhaps, but mm. and a different handling in paintings and prints. But why do we not see shadows and what's the, mm. uh, the situation there within Japanese art at the time? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question, I think. Um, there are shadows in, in Japanese art if they're sort of associated with drawings and, and prints that are deliberately westernized. So they deliberately use, they intentionally use one point perspective, which draws the eye towards the distance. There are, there's a, there's a, a genre of, of landscape and, and interiors that um, really are, draw on that, on that Western tradition, which came in through Dutch prints or Dutch books and so on. The interesting aspect of Oe's work is that she tends to include shadows more than Hokusai. Hokusai does include sort of shading, but a real definite sense of shadow. So it is, at this point, is it possibly a personal preference and also what Japanese would have been used to seeing in this period and that it might not have been sort of, it might have been too strange to include that for, for, for this purpose. Mm. Okay, so the last questions I think are on influence and impact and somebody's asking about um, to what extent do we see Hokusai, Hokusai's influence today in Japanese culture uh, in general and on the younger generation? Would you like to answer? Yeah, I think we, I mentioned about the, the Virudaka image being, Virudaka, the Indian king being hit by lightning, that there's tremendous graphic power to Hokusai's um, draftsmanship to his images, that, the images that he conjures up, um, and it does seem to um, be a precursor, it seems to foreshadow that visual impact of manga, and of course we have this word manga that, as Alfred explained, just means random drawings or assorted drawings or perhaps un unhinged or unfettered drawings. Drawings off the top of my head, that's what it literally means. And this has been taken up and is used today for a particular type of graphic art that um, sometimes is akin to cartoons or it's akin to graphic novels. There's a, a, a huge range of manga today. But I think graphic artists in Japan do certainly look to Hokusai. Not Hokusai alone, though. There are other woodblock print artists um, who've had a, a huge influence, like Kuniyoshi, who was a contemporary <coughs> excuse me, of Hokusai. Um, but beyond that, the influence of Hokusai today is hugely I'm, popular, yes. isn't he, as a, yes. a representative of Japanese art. Mm, I, would, I would agree. Yeah. So there's uh, an appreciation of him as an artist and also um, drawing on his work, um, taking inspiration from his work. So the last, very last question is going to be about the impact or the significance of this exhibition to Europe, to the world, but I would expand that perhaps to to our understanding of Hokusai. I think we've touched on this, but if you could give us a summary statement about how does this help us, how does this discovery of this group of drawings help us understand this master better? Well, I mean, it, it really, um, he's taking on new projects late in life, first of all. This is something he had never tried before. He had never had anything to do with an encyclopedia before this point. So even into his 70s and 80s, Hokusai is pushing forward in his own style, in his own interests, and it is uh, renews our appreciation for um, his astonishing facility and his invention. I think that is as, as much as anything is, is what what this exhibition is, and this discovery is is, is just a fantastic um, reaffirmation of our appreciation for for Hokusai as, as a as a world artist, really, not just for Japan, but as a world artist, an inspiring figure. Thank you. It's been wonderful being able to share this exhibition with you today and hearing some of your questions. And I'm sure we'll be receiving more uh, inquiries and in our digital events and when you come to visit us in person at the exhibition. Thank you very much. Thank you.